All right, let's get started. So, Evan Wynn, welcome to the show, brother. Um, we had a little technical difficulties, but we'll roll through it. Um, so, the reason I wanted to bring you on, Evan, is because you and I have known each other for a few years. Uh, we met at some events like that. I always see you as a leader in the, the Vietnamese community and the real estate and investing community. And I uh, just really admire like the, the path that you've taken from seeing you go from you know, the traditional real estate agent to the savvy investor and stuff like that. And you, and you do a lot of stuff behind the scenes that probably people don't know about. Um, so I really thought it'd be great to kind of show some of the listeners um, on how to think outside the box, right? How to expand their horizons from just being a realtor to being able to create wealth through real estate investing. And I think you're a perfect example of that. So um, why don't you go ahead and maybe tell our, our, our viewers or listeners you know, a little bit about you and how you got started. Well, uh, first and foremost, thanks for having me here, bro. I've been watching some of your podcasts and really inspiring me to, to actually come do this. Um, and again, the end goal is to really to give back and also uh, save some time for some of the people that like to get started in this business. Yeah. Um, for me, you know, going back, uh, you know, really how I got started in this business is, is as ground up as everyone else, right? I got started in, in the mortgage uh, industry, and I'm sure you did the same thing, mm -hmm. uh, back in 03, and uh, got really started at the mortgage brokerage um, in Freedmont, called Freedmont Bank. I'm not sure they're still there anymore. But uh, got to learn everything from my boy back then, Shah Karimi. Uh, he, he was uh, one of these top producers at the office. And I always see this guy, you know, making great money mm -hmm. and having this lifestyle, like just free. And, 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 and at that time, I was just finishing up college and, uh, you know, got my degree in uh, computer science. I actually worked at uh, uh, SBC Global, AT&T now, back then in <laughs> San Ramon for some time. Yeah. And I, I didn't share this, but uh, I was taking the swing shift. You know, I was working uh, yeah. starting uh, late in the evening all the way to like midnight. At that time, you got all the energy, man. You don't go to sleep at like 4 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, I was working at this, you know, I was a technical en a networking engineer at SBC Global. And daytime, I would start doing some mortgages. Mortgages, all right. So I got to tag along with my boy, uh, Shah Karimi, and he taught me everything I need to know about getting started in the, in the mortgage in business. So at that time we learned the old old school way, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, nowadays we have Mojo Dollar, we have all these farm and yeah, technology. Yeah. Back then it was just a white page book, and he was just like, "Hey, call everyone that lives in Fremont. Chainsaw, they will have eight percent or more, and they need to refinance." Hit the phones, right? <laughs> and you know, he I was surprised already when he gave me that corner office with no window, and I remember that specifically. I come into the office, go into that desk, and there's no window. Yeah, there's no distraction. And just banging the phone, calling everybody. And I remember my first yes was like uh, uh, Mission Hill, Fremont. It was a $2.3 million house. The guy was on a uh, five arm and he needed to refinance it. Interest rate was nine point something. I forgot what it was. But I went there and I was like, you need to refinance. I don't really know how to sell a deal, but eventually uh, I just presented the product and that's all I knew how to do. Um, presented the product and he signed on and we refinanced him that $2.3 million loan and I make like $2,500 out of it. <laughs> yeah. uh, at that time I knew and I found later and found out how much Shaw made in that yeah, deal. Yeah. I was like, what? Yeah, uh, yeah. But yeah, pay, you know, actually have to pay for it, my dues and, and learn everything I need to do. And soon after I became uh, one of the top producers of the office and got transferred and moved to uh, another company, Countrywide. And, uh, um, you know, at Countrywide, I learned how to uh, provide the solution to real estate investors. And at that time, I understand that, you know, uh, uh, a lot of real estate investors, they eventually run into lack of capital. Mm. You know what I mean? And this was back in like 04, 05, where uh, your assets, your real estate, appreciate overnight. Yeah. You know, I don't know if you remember that. You yeah, just yeah. actually put your name down to a, a build a home, and then by the time they finish building, you will have like two, three, or 200,000 equity, equity yep, yep. Uh, in the home. So at uh, the Countrywide Loan Officer, I went and I provide solution for them to uh, refinance cash out or uh, to equity loan. Equity loans, yeah. Uh, so that's allowed them to uh, tap into more capital and continue doing their investment. So I was servicing all the real estate broker, all the real estate investor, and learn how to structure all the deals, and eventually, um, you know, when it got to uh, 06, 07, and 08, and, and you remember 08 was just the dark days, right? Yep. All the bank was yeah. just kind of falling out off the grid. 
Um, so my lender at the Countrywide at the time went out of the business, yeah. and I, I, I got transferred to IndyMac. Didn't last very long there, and then eventually, and actually I learned something when I was with IndyMac. IndyMac at the time was one of the biggest construction lenders. Oh, okay. So they would fund, and I got to work with some of the construction loan, fund all these construction loans for the, the builders. Wow. So I, I made some connection with friends that does uh, small development and construction and building. Uh, so I was funding their loans for them, and I got to learn their deals. Yeah. And eventually, IndyMac went, they went under. under right? they, yeah, they I went remember under. that. I remember they went under. So um, IndyMac got took over by the government, and for a short period of week, I was a government employee. <laughs> you can put that on your resume, bro. Yeah, I know. They, um, so, uh, you know, and I was like, you know what? This is not going to work out. So at that time, I had to decide whether, you know, knowing everything I know at that time, you know, I, I, I wanted to get into real estate investment. Got it. Uh, on the real estate side of it, and I remember that, that was like the biggest decision I had to make yeah. because, uh, you know, going doing everything mortgage to real estate and it was like 360 for me. Yeah. You know what I mean? I think and, a lot of agents, like, they made that jump, right? It was like, since loans were getting crazy and it correct. was harder to do loans, they had to make that shift, right? Yeah. So, uh, you know, like everyone else, you know, all the real estate agent dreams, right? I got my real estate license. As, as a matter of fact, I got my real estate license and I go and get my real estate broker license right away. And I have one goal that is start my own brokerage and I did that. <laughs> um, you know, just in late 2009, I started my own brokerage and yeah. I went for the REO just like everyone else. I, I went for uh, the assets from the bank, yeah. uh, the, the, the non-performing uh, assets. So I, I, again, learn everything ground up, yeah. right? As an REO broker, REO agent, you're the first one to the property. Yeah. So you're the first one to see what we call now a deal, right? Yeah. But back then, it was an asset. You have to do tons of BPLs. Yeah. Uh, so the BPLs, of course, learn, uh, teach you how to calculate value, yeah. estimate value at the current stage, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so I got to learn a lot of those, did ton, tons of BPLs and yeah. all these ground level stuff. Uh, I had to go to see some of these REO property when, you know, like so other agent would like refuse. Yeah. And I would take on anything. I imagine the people are pissed off and stuff like that, right? Yeah. When you're showing up. Not only that, there's a lot of horrible story when it, when it comes to REOs, but you know, imagine this is their lifetime saving. Yeah. And you're coming in, let them know that your home is being foreclosed and you're like the first one there. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's, that's so it, it got real tough real soon. Um, but you know, what it did, it enabled me to, you know, look at all these deals, yeah. all this property. And eventually turn into a listing and attract investors. Mm, and okay. uh, by listing some of these properties, I, I started to draw investors from the Bay Area. Yeah, phone starts ringing, right? Hey, phone I'm an investor, ringing. I want to buy this house. Yeah, right? Can yeah. You help me? So I was starting to work with real estate investors, and I, I, I soon realized a lot of investors from the Bay Area. And, you know, coming from the East Bay and then moved to Sacramento and then uh, do some of the Sacramento REOs and attract some of the uh, real estate investors from the Bay Area. I, I knew the Bay Area language. I knew how savvy they were yeah. and what they were looking for and how they tap into their fund because I did some of their loans back then. Wow. So I tap into some of my database too and I say, hey, I got some of this deal. Yeah. And I start bringing them to the investor. And at that time, I was just servicing them as a listing agent or a buy agent. So you, you help the investor find the deal and then they were buying and flipping the property? Correct. Okay. So they turn around and list it with me and I get yeah. to know how much they make and that some of the dude was making 30, 40% return by just doing some, you know, painting and carpet replacement and things like that. At that wow. time, I was like, wait a minute, this is, this is awesome, right? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> not only I'm providing a solution, but I'm, I'm tapping into something else. I'm tapping yeah. into, uh, you know, uh, a limited amount of, uh, these people have money. Yeah, yeah. And I soon later learned that they, they have very little time. Yeah, you know they're they're from the Bay Area. It's very difficult for them. So I started making deals with some of my investors, and I, and I made them an offer. I was like, hey, if, if you if you, you can fund all these deals, I'll take care of all the heavy lifting. Yeah, from fixing, you know, managing the crew all the way to clean it up, you know, stage it, professional photo, all yeah. the way into an end product, and wow. then sell it for a margin. And that time I was learning how to flip. Mm. You know, I was yeah. learning the entire process from A to Z, yeah. uh, from funding it all the way to finding the deals yeah. and know how to analyze the deals all the way into, you know, do it, do what I actually was set to do as a real estate agent was to sit, list it and sell it at the highest value as mm -hmm. possible. Um, so uh, it, it, all that kind of move on towards, um, you know, being at the courthouse and competing for a, yeah. uh, an auction. 
So did the light bulb go off at that point? It's like, hey, you're helping these investors find these deals, right? Right. You start thinking like, man, how can I now be more involved, right? Like, oh, what what was running through your head, you know, that gave you the confidence to like even approach these guys, right? And say, hey, let me be your partner, or right? so you know. And this goes out to all the real estate professional, real estate realtor out there. Like, I never kind of position myself or treat myself as a, a real estate agent, as a realtor. Mm-hmm. You know, I always position myself as an entrepreneur. Mm-hmm. You know, as an entrepreneur, you are business minded, you are, you how to, you know how to create a deal. Mm-hmm. And you know how to create a win-win situation type of deal. Yeah. So uh, the light bulb went off and I knew that these investors need assistance on, in terms of the operation side of it, because they're not local at Sacramento. There, there's a lot of traveling back and forth, yeah. and so I started to, you know, make him an offer, become a, a partner, an operation partner, mm-hmm. an operating partner that can bring a lot of value to the table, yeah. right? Finding the deals, uh, not just any deal, a juicy deal, yeah. deals with a lot of margin, a lot of profit on, on, on the deal. That's the hardest yeah. part, right? Correct, <laughs> correct. And if you've been real estate flipping for the last five years, you understand that finding the deal is the toughest part. Yeah. Everything else is just easy, yeah, right? Yeah, uh, So. So, you know, I come in and provide solution. Mm-hmm. And as an entrepreneur, you know how to provide business solution. And that's the number one thing. Yeah. Right? Uh, know th- what their problems are and then yeah. and, 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 and provide them a solution that they can't say no to. Yeah. Right? So I, I started to offer my partnership, uh, you know, operating, you know, they fund the deal, I'll do all the work and we just split down the middle. Yeah. And eventually grow my portfolio over time. I started to use some of that capital, invest in my own deal. Mm-hmm. And uh, eventually, you know, exchange and buy and up lake to something that I like to keep for a long term. Got it. So, so you're you're helping these investors find the deals. Now you're a partner. Now you're making some money on that end. You build some cash flow, some some cash, right? Now right. you say, I'm going to go do some of my own deals now with yeah. the cash, right? Yeah. Right. So you're slowly just climbing up, climbing up the ranks. Yeah. So, uh, for I think you're you are your best client. Yeah. Right. So you know what you want and you, you got to learn how to be your best client. A lot of real estate agents fail because they keep on serving the client but not treating themselves as a client mm. because you're the first person to that deal. Mm-hmm. You know how juicy that deal can be. Yeah. And if you figured out how to run fa- raise fundraising mm-hmm. and uh, sometimes you don't have to kind of fundraise the entire thing. You can bring yeah. in partners, yeah. right? Like I mentioned. So. Uh, you are your best client, so treat yourself as a client. Yeah, you know what I mean. And there's always the old saying, the saying that if it deal's so good, why aren't you buying it yourself? Yeah, right. So I took that to the heart, and eventually, uh, you know, accumulate properties over the years. Wow. Okay, yeah. that's awesome, man. And um, I think that's inspiring for a lot of people because I feel like a lot of realtors they're just in that one track mind, like close this deal, make the commission, close this deal, make the commission, and meanwhile. You know, I've learned over the years that you're not going to get, you know, wealthy just selling real estate, right? Right. You need wealthy buying real estate, right? And making those investments work for you. And you can do the two hand in hand, right? You know, use your, your commissions from real estate to fund some of your own deals or start building the partnerships, like you said. Right? Yeah. And, and people tend to invest back into what they know best, mm-hmm. right? So if you're a high tech individual, if you are a healthcare individual, you tend to invest in that sector that you know best. Yeah. And if you're in real estate and you not invest back into real estate, you're doing something wrong. Yeah. So doing deals, uh, listing seller, that's to create the rich now, mm-hmm. right? But you gotta be able to accumulate the capital and build wealth for the future. Got it. Because that's your 401k, that's yeah. your retirement. Exactly. So um, that's something that I think a lot of real estate agents tend to kind of neglect. Yeah. They, they, they so caught on with doing so good at what they're doing now, but not saving some and, and invest back into what they know best for the future. Yeah. Now let's, let's shift gears a little bit. Um, you know, so you've obviously started flipping your own properties and you've had some experience with that over the last, you know, year or two markets starting to act a little, you know, a little yeah, crazy. For right? sure. And so what I've noticed about you is that it seems like, you know, when to shift gears, right? And I think that's very important being an entrepreneur or just in any business is knowing when you gotta maybe switch directions and go a different way. So what have you been up to lately now to make some of your investments work for you? <laughs> uh, well, uh, I for me, I think uh, knowing how to maneuver mm-hmm. in different markets and uh, you know, lucky enough, we've been in the business long enough to know and you know, to learn from the last cycle 
and to understand now that this is a totally different market than mm -hmm. what it used to be like a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. So as a real estate flipper, you know, adding value uh, uh, is now is not enough. Yeah. You know, um, we have a lot of competition out there. There's a lot of wholesalers, a new breed of, of, of business, of competitors mm -hmm. that will get get first to the deal and make a markup on that to make our margin even smaller. Mm -hmm. um, so at that, at that time, we have to figure out a way to still make sense investing in the Bay Area. Mm -hmm. We had a lot of options to go out of states and uh, we just decided to, again, do what, do what we know best. Mm -hmm. And uh, real estate is super hyper local. It is, uh, you know, you have to know the local information to yeah. know how to benefit from the deal. So going from that, we, we got into, um, you know, looking at some of your, our assets and see how we can maximize the best out of it. Uh, if you're looking at real estate properties right now, real estate investment, you're, you're, if you're buying it for regular rental, your performer is going to be terrible. You, you're barely doing anything like 2 to 3% cap rate return. Yeah. Um, and then buying it high and mm -hmm. then putting in some improvement, then rent it out won't make any sense at all. Yeah. Uh, if you have to sell it, then the margin not really there. So again, you, you're kind of like stuck in the middle. So we actually looking into all the solutions, all the rental solutions that can maximize our return for our investment. So we're looking at NOI. So two things I got to learn in the past two years, uh, starting to do what I do, is get into a short-term rental and look at the NOI uh, to arrive to a internal rate return of my assets gonna be in five years. Mm. So we're looking at property in location that we can, go, uh, we can actually utilize for short-term rental or corporate housing. So with short-term rental, Airbnb, uh, uh, um, you know, Booking.com and all these sites uh, are now booming and growing, uh, providing you know, better uh, user interface, more friendly. Uh, people are now t more kind of uh, adaptive to Airbnb versus like, uh, I would say just a couple years ago. Yeah. And sim similar to Uber, right? I mean, uh, the, I remember the first time getting in the Uber car, it was like, it's weird. Like you get in the back of someone's car and not, not knowing if they have a license or, or anything like that. And you just trust that system and, and go, <laughs> right? Now it's also become like a, a second nature. You just yeah. book and go, right? When was the last time you compare the fare rate between a taxi and Uber? You don't. Yeah. You just go for what's most convenient. Yeah, exactly. You, right? just, you need it right there, so whatever is convenient, right? Correct. So learning all that, we now uh, providing short-term solutions, uh, especially the local area that we're at now in, in Silicon Valley. Uh, we know there's a need of housing, mm -hmm. right? Not everyone can afford uh, like a 12 months rent if they're here just for a three months project, mm -hmm. right? Uh, a lot of us, the, the business sector, including the high tech and the healthcare, the travel nurse, right? Uh, hospital now are, they can't hire a nurse paying a Bay Area salary. Right, it's going to be very expensive. Yeah. Uh, so they start looking into travel nurse. Right, they they start to have a lot of contract, three four month contract for travel nurse. It make total sense for them to come to the Bay Area, work for three four months, mm -hmm. and then go back home and and own a house for two hundred fifty thousand dollars, three thousand square feet, and get paid somewhat Bay Area salary. Yeah, exactly. Right, so it make more sense, but they need housing solution. Yeah. Right. Um, they can't stay at a hotel at 200 square feet, uh, no kitchen, or even extended stay with a kitchen net. But you gotta pay, you know, you gotta pay for, you, you gotta use the, uh, you know, it's not comfortable. Yeah, it's not comfortable. You know, you, you can't just work 12 hour shift or 10 hour shift and come home to a 200 square feet, <laughs> well, you know, four by uh, four walls and then just, um, you can't cook, you, you don't have a backyard, uh, you use public Wi-Fi, you gotta pay for yeah. high-speed Wi-Fi. I mean, I just came back to some of the major hotels and, and, and I, like, you have to pay for high-speed internet nowadays? Yeah. I mean, is that still a thing, right? At our Airbnb or short-term rental corporate housing, we provide all that for free. Yeah. They get 200 megs of high-speed internet, they get access to a full kitchen, backyard, Man. free parking, yeah. private Wi-Fi, and it's just comfortable, quality home yeah. away from home. Right, so we provide that, and now it's opened up to allow us to not only rent the whole house, but be able to rent room by room. Mm, so when you do the cash flow, right? correct, maximize the profit, the cash flow, the NOI. So that allow us to yeah, not only that, but increase our occupancy rate. Yeah, because if you rent the whole house to a single tenant, um, and I don't know about you, but when I look at my long term rental portfolio, every time there's a setback the security deposit is never enough to cover the loss of rent and the repair to get the property back in the market, let, let alone there's vacancy, right? Wow. So when you take all that deduct out the entire time that you own that rental property yeah. for, with that tenant, 
the, the dump that out and divide it by your value, your return, your, your, your cap rate is very low, mm. right? And if you do that with the Bay Area, for example, life example, you own a $1.2 million value property, a yeah. single family, three bedroom, two bed, you know that's how yeah. much it is in the Bay Area. The rent is $3,500 a month. Yeah. Multiply it by 12, subtract out the property tax, subtract out the insurance, yeah. subtract the property management fee. Doesn't make subtract sense, right? the <laughs> loss of rent. Yeah. The loss of rent divided by 1.2 million, you luckily, if you get 3%, yeah. the inflation is already like close to 2%, yeah. right? So you're not performing. So now it doesn't make sense owning a property in the Bay Area. Right? Yeah. So at the short term, a couple of things that we can do and then we kind of tap into, you know, we, by doing the room to room, we now increase occupancy. Our, our rate, our daily rate, we call it ADR. It fluctuates based on the supplies and demand. Mm -hmm. You know, what's in the area, whether or not there's an event, there's a convention, there is a concert or, uh, you know, we'll play off or anything like yeah, that. Yeah. Our rates go up and down. Yeah. So we build to not only have one fixed rent, but capitalize on the peak market, on the peak season, get to the cap rate, and then that increase over time, right? Mm. By building reviews and good reputation. And, um, and then we have company looking at uh, our property to stay. Wow. For example, PG&E, if they're working on a project in that neighborhood, they're looking for a property, they stay there. Wow. They can put four to five guys in there versus paying four to five hotel rooms and that yeah. is more cost effective for them. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a group that did a project with Google and they, they flew in and they're from Japan. So they, they wanted to get the whole house so they all the entire team can stay together. Yeah. It's a think tank, mm -hmm. right? As a matter of fact, we call some of our uh, properties think tank. Right, yeah. so they can actually stay together. We have a lot of beds in the house. Mm. Uh, we would have uh, at one point we have like bunk beds in the living room. Yeah, <laughs> uh, to, just to create a, a, a space, and we have some some executive people work for eBay, stayed at our property because, you know, they they, they have like a five million dollar house in the city, but they yeah. rather come in here during their, ex, you know, maybe a project that they're working yeah. on. So they need a place just to go home and crash and then reset and do it again next day. Right. So again, these are the housing solutions that yeah. uh, desperately need at the Bay Area. So we provide that. Yeah. And, and for you as the investor, right, that creates opportunity, right? You're taking these, you know, fluctuations in the market from flipping and now creating these opportunities to still continue to get good returns on your investments. Absolutely. Right? So now going back to the drawing board, you're looking at the NOI, yeah. right? With the net operating income, uh, after you deduct all your expenses, multiply it by 12 right? Yeah. Divided by the, the assets that you get, now your cap rate is higher, but you take that, you multiply it by five, and you exit it in five at X amount of equity or selling, mm -hmm. right? Now you get a high return wow. of your investment. So That's you're, smart, man. <laughs> so you're, you're now your return of investment, your IRR, your, is now looking better. Wow. Yeah. Right? Well, so, I mean, I think we can obviously go on for days, man, about the whole investing thing, and you're obviously passionate, you know, about everything you're doing. Um, I think, you know, to kind of summarize, or the last thing I want to touch on real quick before we wrap up is this, as you've made these kind of climbs and shifts and all that stuff, it's obviously giving you more confidence, right? To start Absolutely. like tapping into new territory and stuff like that. Like what's your message to people who are just starting out at the bottom, right? Like, cause you obviously didn't get here overnight, right? What's your message to them? People who have dreams of like, yeah, I'm a realtor. I want to look into it because I get that all the time. Yeah, I'm thinking about getting into investing. They don't know where to start, right? What's maybe a quick piece of advice you can give them? Well, the, the first and the quickest advice is to start doing something. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't just be over analyzing behind the computer screen and not doing anything. Right? You can volunteer in any deal. Uh, you can start doing something, right? Go, go to meet up, learning some of these investors, what they're doing. But from my journey, uh, what I learned is that, you know, I'm a byproduct of all my mistakes. You know, I make a lot of mistakes. Uh, I fail a lot. The one of my model is failing forward. I always looking to, if I fall, what I learn from that, yeah. and then keep failing. And uh, like when I first started in real estate investment, you know, uh, uh, I, I wanted to do a lot of things. But again, you have to stay focused. Um, provide solution. If you just first starting out, uh, your solution could be providing extra human capital. You know, uh, they they may have to fund, they may get the deal, but volunteer to for their deal. Volunteer to, I don't know, do anything, be their runners, anything like that. Yeah. But provide solution and start from there. Increase your ability to to provide more solution for that deal. You know, structuring the deal, finding the deals, uh, running the deal, and eventually um, uh, managing the deal. Yeah. You know, managing that assets over time. 
uh, no one buy a real estate investment and die with it. Mm -hmm. Everyone buy that real estate investment so they eventually can uplate it for something else. So that is the reason why our real estate agent and our realtor is always going to be in the business. Yeah. Uh, if you understand that, then you know that everyone have a need. They don't have the time. Yeah. They are good at what they're go doing. A lot of investors, we find that they are very good at what they're doing and they tend to be very savvy in their own way, mm -hmm. right? It, it, that, what they know. But what you know and solution that you bring to the table is what you know and the talent you got to, to do that specific task. Yeah. Right? Is to improve their real estate investment. Yeah. No one's going to come to you and say, look, I own a $1.2 million deal making $3,500 a month, and I'm okay with that. Yeah. They not, always want to make more, right? <laughs> not when you bring them a property that's probably 1.5, but bringing them a, you know, 5% return versus 2% of what they're getting. Yeah. You know, it's a right? no-brainer. It's a no-brainer. Yeah. It is it's an up leg opportunity. So no one's going to say no to that. So I know how to um, understand the problem and first understand our problem and be the solution provider. Uh, work on it, work on that craft, and I think that's going to improve and help your business tremendously. Wow. Man, I think we hit it, bro. I really appreciate you coming out, man. I learned I learned a lot of stuff just from listening to you, even me being in the business, but I think there's a lot of value that you know our listeners and viewers can, can take from it. Uh, I just want to say congrats, man, on all your success. I wish you the best, and I know you're going to keep shifting. I'm going to keep watching you, hopefully learn <laughs> some more stuff from you, bro. We're, we're still learning, and uh, like I say, this whole Airbnb corporate housing and uh, getting into the hotel space now is really l teaching us a lot of things yeah. and, 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 and help shaping down what we want to do. But what we're doing right now as a company is we're focusing on passive income. Yeah. You know, I mean, something that instead of buying flip, now we're buying hold and uh, perform the access where, you know, it create a passive income for us. Yeah. And that will weather the storm in case the market, you know, turn or anything like that. Yeah. If the market turn and you do it all over again. Yeah. There you go, guys. Follow this guy, Evan Huynh. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Good stuff, bro. Thank you.